good morning and a very warm welcome to all the participants from the National Academy of Customs in Direct Access and Narcotics, NASIN, to this inaugural two day training session, module being conducted by the Manor Parikar Institute of Defense Studies and Analysis via webinar. Uh, I would request uh, the participants can keep their mics muted and their cameras on during the complete uh, session. Mics muted and cameras on, please. Thank you. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, I am Commodore Robbie Thomas, officer in charge of training at MPIDSA. I'm a serving naval officer. And assisting me in this module will be Dr. Matthew Sinu Simon, who is a research analyst at MPIDSA. So we are waiting for the inaugural address, which will be conducted by the Director General of MPIDSA, Ambassador Sujan R. Chenoy, who will be joining us shortly. Meanwhile, I will take uh, 10 minutes to walk you through a brief introduction of MPIDSA. MPIDSA training module. Starting with a brief history of MPIDSA, this was established in November 1965 by the Defense Minister Shri Vai B. Chavan. We are an autonomous think tank funded by the MOD, and we have played a crucial role in shaping India's foreign and security policy for the past 50 years. We deal with issues related to conventional, non conventional threats, nuclear weapons and military expenditure. The governance at MPIDSA is presided over by the Honorable Raksha Mansuri. We have seven distinguished members who are elected to the Council of MPIDSA for two years. And our ex-official members are the Defense Secretary, the Foreign Secretary, the Director General, and the Deputy Director. The Director General of MPIDSA is presently Ambassador Sujan R. Chenoy. MPIDSA is a non partisan autonomous body dedicated to objective research and studies in all aspects of defense and security. Our mission is to promote national and international security through the generation and dissemination of knowledge on defense and security related issues. We have a well qualified multidisciplinary research faculty drawn from the armed forces and the civil services representing a diverse background. We have research and institute is driven by a comprehensive agenda and by the need to provide impartial analysis and policy recommendations. We publish journals, monographs, briefs, books, which are the principal mediums through which our analysis and policy recommendations are disseminated. In addition, the news media also carries views of MPIDSA experts in the form of interviews and participation in debates. We have 14 research centers, seven of which are primarily regional and seven deal with focus sectors such as military affairs, internal security, strategic technologies, non-traditional security. Our new center is counterterrorism, counter radicalization and terror financing, nuclear arms control, defense economics and industry. What you see here are the publish are the publications that we take out on various occasions. And this is also brought out via our web page, Facebook, Twitter and YouTube account. Our website www.idsa.in is where you will find a host 
of material through which of your interest you can access we are also a forum of, of debate on national and international conferences we have regular round table conferences every year on important issues which presently we are undertaking through webinars we have the weekly fellow seminars to discuss and analyze contemporary issues we undertake training for the defense forces ordnance factory board border security force ntro drdo and also for state governments young parliamentarians and for the us office of defense cooperation for uh, various factors of procurement what is shown here is your training program for today we will be starting at 10 o'clock by the inaugural address by the director general of mp idsc the topic will be global sec security environment following that from 11:30 to 12:45 will be the topic india china trade undertaken by professor sk mohanty after lunch you will have cross border challenges with nepal fake currency gold and drug smuggling taken by dr nihar nayak and the last lecture for today will be on artificial intelligence with special reference to data security being taken by dr gulshan rai tomorrow the first lecture will be on the importance of strategic communication for national security taken by the deputy director general of mp idsc mayor general bipin bakshi following that will be the lecture on financial cyber crimes and fraud being taken by mr nandukoma sarvade the first lecture post lunch will be essentials of cyber security and cryptocurrencies by mr muni sharma and the last lecture will be the challenges of terror financing in india and the way ahead taken by colonel vivek chadda of r n institute so that is a brief induction of mp idsc and now we will await the inaugural address by ambassador sujan r chenoy So shall I start, sir? Uh, yes, if you don't mind. Yes, thank you, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning to you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'll start by introducing our first speaker, the Director General of MPIDSA, Ambassador Sujan R. Chenoy. Ambassador Chenoy took over the present appointment as Director General of MPIDSA on 3rd January 2019. He has been a career diplomat of the Indian Foreign Service. from 1981 to 2018 that is for 37 years prior to joining mp idsa he was india's senior most ambassador tenanting the appointment of india's ambassador to japan and republic of marshall islands from 2015 to 2018 prior to that he was india's ambassador to mexico and high commissioner to belize from 2012 to 2015 The ambassador has served in Indian missions in Hong Kong, Beijing, and Riyadh, and as consul general in Shanghai and Sydney. He has also served as India's representative to the first committee at the United Nations in New York, dealing with disarmament and international security affairs. At headquarters in the Ministry of External Affairs, he was director China, as well as head of the expert group 
of diplomatic and military officials tasked with CBMs and boundary related issues with China for four years. He was also the desk officer for the United States of America. On deputation for four years with the National Security Council Secretariat under the Prime Minister's office, Ambassador Sujan Chenoy worked on internal and external national security policy and anchored strategic dialogues with key interlocutors around the world. He is fluent in English and Chinese Mandarin and conversant in French, Spanish, German, Japanese, Arabic, Urdu, and French Koryol. Today, Ambassador Sujan R. Chanoy will be talking to you on the topic global security environment. Ladies and gentlemen, the Director General of MPIDSC, Ambassador Sujan R. Chanoy. Thank you very much, uh, Commodore Robbie Thomas, for that uh, very, very generous introduction. As I've said before, sometimes you get to know more about yourself through such uh, introductions. Uh, but let me begin by saying it's a great pleasure for me to address uh, the National Academy of Customs and Indirect Taxes and Narcotics, NASIN, uh, in its uh, training module and to kick off the lecture series uh, with uh, this talk this morning on global security environment. Now, before I do that, I uh, would very much like to thank Mrs. Nita Lal Butalia, additional secretary, uh, who has actually, along with uh, Mr. Upadhyay, ADG, uh, put together this uh, program in consultation with us. And I think part of the reason is also uh, the fact that uh, uh, I had uh, Mrs. Uh, Nita Lal Butalia as my colleague and director when I was uh, joint secretary in the National Security Council Secretariat for four years. Uh, it was uh, a great pleasure to work with her, a thorough professional, uh, a person who has a head and heart in the right place. Uh, so I'm very glad that she's also in some ways associated with the mentoring of uh, young officers such as yourselves. Uh, I also want to acknowledge and thank uh, Ms. Rachana Tanwar, course director, and Ms. Poonam Bhatt, associate course director, for helping to put this uh, capsule together. Now, I've been asked to speak uh, about the global security environment, which is a vast topic, but let me kick off uh, the uh, presentation today by uh, speaking of uh, a world and reminding you that the world that we live in today is undergoing a fundamental transformation. The, the very fragile international compact that had prevailed until the end of last year, in any case, has been dealt a completely mortal and devastating blow by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it has uh, uh, exposed flaws in global governance structures. It has uh, exposed the lacuna in national capacities, particularly in healthcare. Multilateralism itself has suffered a great retrenchment, as you can see uh, as, uh, in, in the form of the very uh, lackadaisical, uh, less than ideal response from uh, structures such as the United Nations. Uh, now, we have seen that the politics of the pandemics has also dissipated energies everywhere. The international community has actually moved away from key developmental issues and focused more on, obviously, uh, the very disturbing aspects of the origins of the pandemic uh, and the uh, global debate that uh, surrounds uh, this particular uh, you know, scourge that we are facing today. The global economy is reeling uh, under the unexpected effects, again, of uh, COVID-19. And if there was uncertainty uh, in the process of globalization, if there was marginalization of countries in the process of globalization, uh, that process has only been further uh, highlighted as a result of uh, the setback suffered everywhere uh, in economic terms. Uh, the IMF has, as you know, predicted a global recession um, and countries everywhere are struggling to kickstart their economies. Having gone through COVID uh, without much of a solution in sight, it has also dawned upon countries that we cannot sit back and switch off all the engines, uh, simply waiting for a favorable time to restart 
And therefore, this effort is simultaneous, dealing with the pandemic and also trying to keep the economy uh, going at the same time. Uh, so the notion of uh, national security, global security, all this is being reshaped today by the COVID-19 pandemic. Armed forces in particular everywhere, the type that my institute deals with, uh, are also under stress. Uh, they are often required to undertake operations in confined spaces. They live uh, in, in, in close confined spaces with their colleagues, whether it is in bunkers, whether it is in the icy you know, uh, heights of Ladakh, or whether it is on uh, you know, submarines uh, and aircraft carriers uh, in the oceanic spaces. They have to be worried about uh, maintaining uh, their health and uh, physical preparedness. And of course, uh, uh, this is the kind of uh, issue that is also seized upon by adversaries when they engage in psychological uh, warfare, uh, psyops. Uh, uh, you have China, for instance, trying to remind the world today through the Global Times that the Indian armed forces uh, and paramilitary forces uh, have a very large and disproportionate number of COVID cases, and that uh, uh, is uh, telling on our uh, defense preparedness. It's, it's psyops, as you can see. So COVID-19 affects the armed forces, not just directly, but also as a result of propaganda uh, that adversaries uh, tend to uh, you know, wage against us. The notion of critical infrastructure is also undergoing change. You're all aware of the fact that the digital space the cyberspace has always been vulnerable uh, to national security challenges, to disruptions of the highest order. But what COVID-19 has actually shown is that the world will have to increasingly for the foreseeable future rely on uh, platforms and instruments uh, such as the one that we are using today in order to conduct uh, all kinds of transactions, whether they are uh, physical uh, in terms of uh, you know, sort of training modules such as ours, they have all shifted to uh, a digital space today. Um, in the financial sector, uh, there is only uh, greater stress today on using uh, cyberspace to conduct uh, operations. And as there is greater reliance globally on artificial intelligence, surveillance technologies, online, uh, you know, platforms, big data, uh, the IoT, uh, part, etc., uh, we will find that uh, there is equally a growing threat, uh, an um, increasingly sophisticated threat to cyberspace uh, as a result of this domain becoming uh, much more important. Uh, so uh, the good guys will be using these technologies more, but the bad guys will also be using these technologies equally. Uh, the advantage, of course, eventually will go to nations uh, that uh, enjoy greater internet penetration. It means that uh, we have to place a very high premium on the kind of uh, digital connectivity uh, and cyber connectivity that we put in place uh, within our country as well. The kind of technologies that we use with regard to, say, 5G uh, of the future, all this will have an impact on uh, this aspect of uh, national security. Um, budgets around the world are undergoing stress. Uh, it's not just for defense that they would undergo stress, but there is an overwhelming uh, emphasis on uh, giving more uh, importance uh, and budgetary salience to healthcare, for instance. Uh, higher standards of hygiene are to be expected in the future. Uh, and um, uh, whether it is uh, the airlines business or tourism, uh, the notion of uh, uh, infrastructure uh, for a certain given number of people is undergoing reinterpretation. Uh, because of the requirements of social distancing. And that is also going to result in enhanced costs. Uh, so uh, overall, we can see that uh, for the foreseeable future, COVID-19 will dictate uh, the terms of uh, engagement. It will frame the reference for national security paradigms. Um, even uh, after a vaccine uh, comes through, uh, much will depend on the costs of production and the ease with which such vaccine uh, is available to the large masses of people around the world. Until and unless uh, there is uh, uh, what we call health for all, there will be no security for all. And this pandemic has also shown that wealth is no security. It is no guarantee. It is no insurance against uh, this kind of uh, a terrible scourge. Power everywhere as a result 
is fractured. Now, power was fractured even before the COVID-19 pandemic on the global stage. We had seen that globalization had created overall uh, a much larger uh, sort of uh, uh, arena in which uh, it was uh, uh, a more of a level playing field where uh, big countries, small countries, rich and the poor were able to equalize through asymmetrical means, using technology at times, using certain weapons of mass destruction, as in the case of North Korea. Uh, countries had learned the fine art, whether through cyber disruption, through missile proliferation, whether through other dubious means to equalize and to bridge the absolute asymmetrical gaps that might exist in power quotients around the world. And that power remains fractured. We had seen before the pandemic too that uh, it was very difficult for any single country uh, to overwhelmingly determine the fate of uh, all issues at all times. Uh, and uh, uh, that process of fracturing of power, that process of uh, an increasing uh, sort of uh, uh, era of friction between uh, the uh, reigning hegemon, that is the United States of America, and the rising hegemon, that is the People's Republic of China, that process has only been accelerated by what we have seen as a result of COVID-19. So today we have reached a stage where on the one hand the world is grappling with the COVID-19 pandemic, on the other hand a putative, a so-called dyad has emerged uh, of the United States and China that is dominating the global discourse. Uh, there is a growing US-China rift uh, which is fundamental in nature, and it is bound to deepen. Uh, so we have the United States of America, which has become extremely inward looking. Uh, and that is uh, uh, something that uh, has altered uh, the uh, debate uh, in terms of, uh, you know, global security paradigms, because an inward looking United States is more in favor of an America first policy, make America great again. It has been conceding space. Uh, what I would like to call a leave of absence from global uh, governance structures. And uh, that leave of absence from, uh, you know, relevant geography around the world and relevant global structures around the world has created a vacuum which uh, is being increasingly uh, and very shrewdly utilized by the People's Republic of China. So you have uh, a disruption being caused by both uh, these powers today. Um, the uh, Chinese are uh, not only seeking to make use of the existing global structures uh, which have been put in place essentially as a result of the efforts of the United States uh, and the Western powers, but it is also trying to alter these structures to suit its own narratives in the future. It is also promoting, for instance, the narrative uh, that uh, the West's governance systems, the West's uh, response to Healthcare such as COVID-19 has utterly failed. Uh, and China is also trying to highlight in this the narrative that China's, uh, you know, governance structures and its healthcare system, uh, its ideology has proved superior in dealing with these challenges, uh, in, in dealing with the challenge of uh, a response, a coherent response uh, to COVID-19, and also in dealing with the challenge of uh, restarting and kickstarting uh, economic growth everywhere. And that is the kind of discourse that we see uh, around us today. In this, I want to highlight the fact that the sheer pace at which China has risen in the last 30, 35 years uh, itself has uh, been a, a source of great disruption uh, around the world. Uh, fundamentally speaking, uh, it is the only country, an example, where in a matter of 35 years, uh, one has seen China going from roughly the same GDP that India had uh, per capita uh, GDP as well as, uh, you know, absolute uh, total GDP that India had in 1980 uh, to being uh, the huge economy that it is today, uh, roughly, you know, 14.7 trillion US dollars, uh, at least uh, five times bigger uh, than India. Uh, the large numbers that it has pulled out of poverty, the material, uh, you know, progress that China has made, obviously, is not something uh, that can be uh, brushed aside. It is something that all, uh, you know, strategists and policy planners must take note of. Uh, but it is equally true to say that 
Now, China has not been able to uh, handle this very well, even in terms of its own outlook, because in 35 years, Chinese decision makers themselves have not been able to come to terms with this huge accretion in their power. And, and they've not been able to understand the, the nature and dynamics of power. What is power? How is power to be exercised? At what stage in the exercise of power uh, would you invite a pushback and uh, a response from uh, others around you? This is something I feel, I feel where the Chinese have utterly failed. They've also failed to see uh, the kind of response uh, that would come about when they changed their policy from uh, what Tang Xiaoping had advocated, which is that uh, hide your capacities and bide your time, uh, which is what Tang had advocated all along uh, through the 1980s and 90s uh, until his death. And uh, a couple of his successors uh, like Chiang Zemin and Hu Jintao uh, had also followed that dictum and aphorism. But it is uh, Xi Jinping, when he came to power in 2012, who has done exactly diametrically the opposite, which is that there is no need for China to, you know, bide its time or hide its power. The time is now to seize the initiative and to make China's power uh, known. So that kind of uh, change that has taken place in China's outlook has also been the source of uh, great uh, disruption. China's future trajectory uh, and I'm dwelling on China because it is a subject of interest to uh, Indians uh, with or without the pandemic, with or without uh, Ladakh, with or without Galwan. China always continues to, to, you know, sort of be at the center of some of the processes, decision making that we, we make on, on uh, national security issues. The point I want to make is that China's future trajectory uh, will be based on uh, probabilities, because uh, the way I look at it, uh, I think we need to request uh, DG HRDs. Uh, yes, thank you very much. It's uh, been muted now. Um, so uh, what I was saying is that when you look at the uh, formation of the People's Republic of China in 1949 and extrapolate till the present, uh, as a scholar, I would like to divide this into three distinct phases. Uh, the first 30 years from 1949 to 1979, as you are all aware, as students of, you know, world history, uh, China suffered uh, a number of, uh, uh, you know, setbacks as a result of uh, its uh, cultural revolution, the great leap forward, the, the great famine of the late 50s and early 60s. And there was, uh, uh, you know, obviously a great deal of turmoil internally. Uh, as Mao Zedong consolidated his power and uh, also wiped out his, uh, you know, uh, sort of enemies in the party. Um, but it is also a phase in which China consolidated its territory and its geography and its governance uh, systems. The next 30 year period is the magic period for China between 1979 and 2009, in which by following that dictum of hide your capacities and bide your time, China made very deft use of uh, America's need for a strategic partner to deal with a rising Soviet Union. Uh, China made very uh, shrewd use of uh, the requirements, uh, both of the United States and Japan and others for economic growth uh, with low cost manufacturing uh, in a large and populous country which China made available to the rest of the world and became the factory of the world. And that kind of, uh, you know, uh, sort of unbridled growth of, uh, uh, you know, eight, nine, ten percent double digit, digit growth is something we saw uh, in that uh, 30 year period. It is the next 30 year period which began, let us say, roughly around 2009. When uh, things started changing, on the one hand, the United States in President Obama's second term was talking about a pivot to Asia, a rebalancing strategy. Uh, towards Asia. Uh, but these were words uh, not matched by deeds. And then you have, uh, you know, uh, Xi Jinping being pitchforked into the topmost position there uh, as president, uh, as, uh, uh, you know, general secretary uh, of the uh, party and as uh, uh, chairman of the Central Military Commission. He comes onto the scene in 2012 and he actually puts into practice uh, what the United States was only uh, talking about, which is a pivot to Asia. The real pivot to Asia or towards the Asia-Pacific 
uh, in the immediate periphery of China, uh, in the broad region of Asia and Africa, and even further afar, was actually the pivot that was effected by China, put in place by China. And China pushed this uh, with additional emphasis on, uh, you know, sort of uh, consolidating its oceanic spaces, keeping the United States at bay, uh, taking over islands in the South China Sea, uh, also, uh, you know, promoting this grand concept of the Belt and Road Initiative for uh, greater uh, connectivity and economic uh, complementarities between itself and the rest of the world, between its production and manufacturing capacities and the markets around the world. And so uh, that is the third phase in which China has entered the first 10 years, uh, roughly from 2009 to uh, 2020 have been very disruptive, have been very different from the previous uh, 30 years. And the next 20 years of this 30 year period will determine the future of China. How, uh, you know, uh, things will shape up will depend on China's behavior. For the moment, we see that China's unilateralism, aggression, its revanchist policies on geography and territory are reverberating and causing disruptions, whether uh, it is the East China Sea, whether it is the South China Sea, whether it is uh, uh, Ladakh. Uh, China has only succeeded in, you know, intensifying rivalries and contestation everywhere. It has ob obviously uh, been roundly criticized as well for its attempts to, you know, withhold information during the pandemic, uh, permitting outbound travel uh, when it knew that it had a pandemic uh, raging. It has increasingly been criticized for its repressive policies in Xinjiang, in Tibet, in Hong Kong, and uh, in general, trying to make use of its charm offensive, um, you know, uh, leveraging its uh, deep pockets uh, to uh, influence uh, outcomes, uh, even at the time of the pandemic. During the pandemic too, China has been using its uh, uh, you know, developmental finance, which comes with strings attached, uh, with political motivation, it's been helping countries around the world. So in this kind of a broad, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, scenario, uh, we see that the regional uh, security situation is also undergoing fundamental transformation. The Asian century that uh, uh, Tang Xiaoping, for instance, spoke about when a young Rajiv Gandhi uh, went and met him in 1988, December 1988, I was part of that visit. Uh, and Tang had spoken about the Asian century. He had also spoken about uh, uh, the Asian century not being complete uh, without the fullest participation of China and India. Now, that Asian century is still very much, uh, you know, uh, unfolding before our eyes in the 21st century because the, uh, the uh, impulse for growth, economic uh, development, manufacturing, uh, even wealth uh, creation, uh, connectivity, all this has shifted towards the Asia-Pacific region. In our own lifetimes, we have seen that. But whether the Asian century will be, uh, you know, multipolar, whether it will be bipolar, whether it will truly be one in which India and China will both share space, this is something that is uncertain. Uh, it uh, may or may not be a century of peace. Uh, it could equally be a century of contestation and war. Uh, that is the way it appears today. In South Asia, as you've seen that, uh, uh, you know, Prime Minister Modi's government has emphasized uh, Sabka Saath, Sabka Vikas, not only as a mantra uh, for our domestic uh, growth and developmental impulses, but also uh, the regional uh, growth and developmental impulse. And you've taken a number of initiatives, you are aware of that, to try and see if we can bring about greater regional integration. Because without greater regional integration, it is very difficult for a country like India to aspire to uh, a greater role on the uh, global stage. Uh, and we have seen that part of the success that China had in terms of its uh, global role uh, was also due to uh, the fact that it had more successfully than us integrated the region around its own developmental and economic growth and, uh, you know, uh, impulses. So uh, uh, we have tried our best too uh, since uh, 2014, uh, uh, including in the context of SARC, uh, without much success, partly because, uh, in fact, I should say entirely because of uh, Pakistan thwarting 
this effort on the part of India uh, and Pakistan continuing uh, to cast its long shadow uh, on India uh, in terms of the cross-border terrorism, uh, which it uh, constantly seeks to promote. Uh, it's a malevolent shadow that continues to affect us, uh, uh, whether in Kashmir or more broadly speaking, uh, in India. Now, Asia's geography is being increasingly defined, or redefined today as a result of the Indo-Pacific. The Indo-Pacific is also something that you keep reading about in newspapers. You come across the term Quad, the quadrilateral uh, security dialogue, uh, uh, and Quad is the you know sh short uh, you know sort of uh, abbreviation of that uh, term. Uh, and so I must tell you uh, a few things about what this Indo-Pacific is all about. Where basically the Indo-Pacific speaks of uh, a certain merging uh, and marriage of geography, uh, a geography that connects uh, the broad oceanic spaces and theaters of the uh, you know, Pacific Ocean, uh, the East China Sea, the South China Sea, uh, and the Indian Ocean as one broad theater. Because we have seen over the last uh, 35 or 40 years as growth and developmental impulses shifted towards the Asia-Pacific region, that uh, uh, these three oceanic spaces and the terrestrial continental uh, geography that abuts these uh, waters is increasingly acting as one in terms of the flow of energy, the flow of trade, uh, the flow of technology, and also uh, the uh, negatives like uh, the spread of terrorism, for instance, the spread of proliferation, uh, human smuggling, uh, you know, uh, narcotic smuggling. Uh, when you look at it, this broad region today is increasingly uh, interconnected. And more relevantly, uh, we saw that in the first phase, uh, indeed after the Second World War, as the growth impulse spread to Asia, uh, we saw the rise of Japan followed by the rise of the Asian tigers. We saw the rise of uh, China thereafter. Uh, and that continues to kind of, uh, you know, catch everyone's attention. But that growth is no longer the monopoly of East Asia. It is no longer the monopoly of uh, East Asia and Southeast Asia. It has actually spread more generally, as we have seen in the opening two decades of this uh, century, to a broader landmass. It has spread towards South Asia. It has spread across the Indian Ocean all the way to the dynamic east coast of Africa as well. And when you therefore connect all these spaces and the dots, you find that, you know, six out of the major energy producers and consumers in the world today are located in this uh, broad expanse of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, the largest uh, uh, sort of uh, incidences of piracy that take place are also taking place, broadly speaking, uh, in uh, this part of uh, the world. So when we speak of Indo-Pacific today as against the Asia-Pacific, uh, what we are really trying to say is that uh, Asia-Pacific of the last century, the latter half of the last century, uh, between the end of the Second World War and the end of the century has now transformed, has grown, has spread, has percolated towards a, a broader theater called the Indo-Pacific, in which all this is interconnected. What happens in one part has a distinct impact on what is happening on the other part. And undergirding all this, of course, is the rise of China and the kind of uh, uh, renewed fresh threat perceptions that it provides to uh, regional players uh, through its activities, through its, uh, you know, uh, sort of entry into the East China Sea and contestation with Japan on the Senkaku Islands or building artificial islands in the South China Sea, or for that matter, uh, uh, coming to the Indian Ocean now uh, in a more brazen and open manner. Uh, that too is uh, a source of, uh, uh, you know, disruption. And it is also what defines the Indo-Pacific today. Uh, the Chinese are, for instance, moving into the Indian Ocean 600 years uh, after uh, their uh, Admiral Chang He had made a few voyages in the 15th century. Between the 15th century and the 20th century, it didn't have much to show by way of any kind of uh, naval presence uh, or, uh, you know, sort of uh, 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 engagement in the Indian Ocean. But today you've seen how rapidly the Chinese are trying to come into these oceanic spaces as well. Uh, they have also tried to follow uh, the island development strategy that the 
the classic uh, colonialists followed in terms of developing islands and then using islands to access the hinterland. And uh, uh, in South Asia, for instance, too, uh, generally speaking, uh, India was regarded as the uh, you know, major power, uh, the more influential power. But in recent decades, we have seen that the Chinese are also moving into South Asia. And that is another uh, cause of disruption. But this is also causing uh, the definition of the Indo-Pacific uh, to actually take shape. That is what I'm trying to tell you. Uh, and uh, uh, one can say very frankly that uh, it is ineffective for the Chinese to be speaking of, uh, you know, an Asia for Asians or, uh, for instance, uh, uh, a, a, an Asia-Pacific in which they would like... Uh, uh, sort of external, so-called external powers to vacate space, primarily to see uh, the exit of the United States of America uh, from its periphery. But this is uh, not practical because uh, powers such as the United States, the UK, France, these are uh, really speaking not extra regional powers. They have a history of either colonial engagement with this part of the world or after the Second World War, uh, a very, very strong uh, economic engagement with the Asia Pacific region. And so therefore, uh, they are not really extra regional powers. They have a physical presence, they have nationals, they have territories, they have bases, uh, they have alliance partnerships. And therefore, uh, it is uh, 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 impractical on China's part to aspire to create a unipolar Asia uh, or an Asia Pacific region in which uh, China is the only dominant power as it seeks to do, it will have to learn to share space with others. In other words, uh, multipolarity is what is likely to see an Asian century of peace and uh, unipolarity of the type that China is attempting is more likely to result in an Asian century of contestation. Uh, so I think we need to keep this in mind. There's yet another point that keeps coming up in the context of the Indo-Pacific uh, and the Quad. The Quad essentially is not uh, uh, you know, tantamount to the Indo-Pacific. Uh, it is uh, a plurilateral dialogue mechanism of the type, uh, you know, that you see uh, around you all the time, uh, in which uh, four like-minded countries, uh, yes, they are all democracies, uh, but then democracy is not the only uh, sort of guiding principle there. Uh, they are keen to work together to create a rules-based order, a rules-based order which can promote you know, counterterrorism uh, can promote uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, capacity building, also ensure uh, unbridled, unimpeded uh, trade and commerce, uh, freedom of navigation, freedom of overflight. Uh, and of course, they also speak of the centrality of ASEAN. Uh, and they do so because they recognize that in the broad expanse of the Indo-Pacific, the ASEAN countries, uh, numbering 10 in all, uh, about the South China Sea, where the sharpest of the contestations is today underway in the form of the artificial islands and claims that the Chinese have made. But in doing so, in highlighting the centrality of ASEAN, which even India has done, we have to keep in mind that the ASEAN itself is not uh, united. It has uh, long been fractured in many ways, especially when it comes to uh, the policy towards China. It has uh, long ceased to be dependent on the West uh, for both its uh, economic and security requirements. It has long begun to be more dependent on China for both economic and security requirements. And within the 10 ASEAN countries, there are countries like Cambodia, Laos, uh, Myanmar, and to some extent Thailand that have already been captivated, mesmerized by the uh, Chinese way of doing things uh, and that prevents the ASEAN from taking a very strong group, uh, uh, you know, regional position when it comes to uh, castigating or criticizing or pillorying China with regard to its, uh, uh, you know, sort of disruptive activities in the South China Sea. The other point is that when we speak of a code of conduct for the oceanic spaces, uh, for a rules-based order, for instance, is what is being aspired through a code of conduct uh, in the South China Sea. Uh, but the code of conduct is being negotiated only between the ASEAN countries and China. And even uh, the United States, Japan, Australia and India have no say in the matter. And that code of conduct still remains like the Holy Grail. It has not been, uh, uh, despite 20 years of negotiations, it has not really seen the light of day. Uh, it is supposed to, uh, you know, come through by 2021, but that's highly unlikely.
So the point I want to make is that ASEAN centrality, uh, we, which we all promote, is actually a double-edged sword. Because uh, in, in talking about ASEAN centrality, the Chinese also see an opportunity to dictate outcomes because they have considerable influence over ASEAN and uh, they have made inroads bilaterally into a number of these ASEAN uh, countries. Now, as to what the, uh, you know, what shape the Quad will take, whether it will actually remain what it is today, which is a dialogue mechanism, whether it will morph into a naval alliance, uh, uh, whether it will become, as the Chinese have been suspecting and criticizing, whether it will become an Asian NATO, uh, which is, uh, you know, out to contain China. All this will depend, in my view at least, on China's behavioral patterns in year, years to come. In fact, one of the guiding forces behind the evolution of the Quad and what direction it takes is, ironically, China itself. Uh, as you are aware, on the 6th, uh, 7th uh, uh, of October, that is, uh, uh, as we speak, in fact, uh, Dr. Jayashankar is supposed to uh, be in uh, Tokyo uh, for a physical meeting of the uh, Quad ministers, uh, the second of such uh, uh, a meeting. The first one was held on the margins of the UN General Assembly uh, last year in 2019. India-China relations uh, are inescapable in terms of the bilateral part. Um, all I want to say at this stage is that a great deal of uh, distrust has, has crept into this uh, ancient relationship that we have had with China. We have otherwise been geographically, uh, you know, existing cheek by jowl uh, across the Himalayas for, for millennia. And for the most part, uh, we have been, I would say, indifferent towards each other. The, the Himalayas as even Pandit Nehru had imagined, formed the great barrier between these two civilizations. And it was not very likely that one would want to go across and aggress against the other. Uh, and it is in that kind of a, a security framework that we kind of coexisted for, you know, 2,500 years. And we uh, found that Buddhism went from India to China. We found the great teachers like, uh, you know, uh, Bodhidharma and Kumar Jiva and others going to China to uh, to to spread the, the word of religion and philosophy. Uh, Chinese scholars came to India in centuries past, uh, Faxian and Xuanzhuang, and and they took back with them scriptures, which they translated into the Chinese language. And these are some of the things that we are reminded of when we think of, uh, you know, our uh, millennial contacts between uh, India and China uh, during our. Uh, respective struggles uh, in the early part of the 20th century, there even seemed to be some kind of sympathy. Uh, Pandit Nehru was very friendly with Chiang Kai-shek, for instance, uh, and uh, had visited China as well. Uh, there was sympathy uh, in India for uh, China's struggle against Japan. But I think uh, in many ways, uh, both countries began to be fundamentally aware of each other as uh, nation states in search of an identity only after India achieved independence in 1947, when the British left, and when China became the People's Republic of China under a communist ideology. Uh, a communist ideology that was not based on a civilizational ethos. It was based on an ideological ethos, which sought to unite, uh, you know, uh, territory, even if it's artificial. And that is why you saw that the uh, the, the among the first things the Chinese did in 1949 was to enter Xinjiang and take over that large province in 1950 to enter Tibet and take over that large province. Luckily for uh, Outer Mongolia, they had escaped uh, this complete takeover by the Chinese because uh, in uh, uh, 1921 or so, uh, the uh, Russians, the Soviets, uh, you know, after the Bolshevik revolution had helped uh, Mongolia, uh, at least part of it, to be independent with guarantees. Uh, so the Chinese could really only take over inner Mongolia, but not outer Mongolia. And that is the kind of China that we inherited as a neighbor in, in 1949. Uh, and very soon we found that, you know, the hindi chini bhai bhai framework didn't really work. Asian solidarity that uh, Nehru was attached to didn't really quite work. Uh, and uh, that China had more on its mind than simply working with uh, India for this kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, Asian brotherhood. China was uh, manifestly ambitious 
uh, was already seeking to, it was training uh, at the leash in terms of uh, living down the notion of being uh, a little brother to uh, the USSR, which was the big brother at that time. It was also very rapidly uh, finding itself in contestation with the United States as uh, China had entered the Korean War in 1950, between 1950 and 1953. The Chinese, uh, so soon after their uh, you know, uh, founding of the People's Republic, actually went to war with the United States. A, a UN force that was led by the Americans was, uh, was uh, engaged uh, militarily by the Chinese uh, in the Korean Peninsula, which brought about the uh, pushback of those forces uh, you know, from the Yalu River uh, towards the 38th parallel, where the two Koreas still remain divided today. So that is the kind of China that we were actually dealing with. And I think India didn't read it very well. India uh, was at that time focusing on uh, heavy industry, the Mahalo Nobis uh, kind of economic developmental model. Defense budget was being pruned. Um, uh, the armed forces were being demobilized. And so a great military that had actually been the vanguard of the British Empire was, uh, you know, kind of down on its last legs during the 50s with very, uh, you know, sparse budgets. Uh, and we learned the lesson in 1962, what lack of military preparedness can do to a nation when pitted against, uh, you know, an ideological uh, uh, and determined uh, uh, adversary such as, uh, as China. Today, for various reasons, we have come a long way. Uh, after a long hiatus in our bilateral ties, uh, following 62, we uh, sent our uh, ambassador back in 1976. We had never cut off diplomatic ties, but we had uh, since 1961 uh, had uh, uh, a charge d'affaires uh, looking after our embassy there. Uh, and so when Mr. K.R. Narayanan uh, was sent back, uh, later, uh, our president, uh, vice president and president, when he was sent back, there was obviously a great deal of hope and expectation that uh, things will, uh, you know, improve. Uh, and in a manner of speaking, it led to the 1980s when uh, it was decided that we can continue to handle the, uh, you know, border issue, but we must not allow that to uh, come in the way of uh, uh, the uh, overall development of uh, our bilateral uh, relations. Uh, and that is the kind of agreement that was reached during Rajiv Gandhi's visit. Now, that too has not really truly worked in our favor, because uh, as we see it in 2020, we have neither been able to resolve our boundary issues with China, nor been able to evolve a framework in which we have, uh, uh, how shall I say, matching expectations and reciprocity. Uh, so, for instance, if we thought we should develop our relations in a trade and economic sphere, uh, that's what we decided in 1988. The point is that as we see it today in 2020, uh, trade is grossly, uh, you know, sort of in China's favor. A very large quantum of trade today uh, is in China's favor. Uh, and uh, uh, Chinese manufacturing has kind of hollowed out India's manufacturing industry over the years. If it is about uh, the one China policy uh, and regarding uh, you know, uh, China uh, in terms of a one China policy and not having diplomatic relations with Taiwan, etc. We have fulfilled that part of the bargain, but China has not done that. China has never subscribed to the one India policy because it continues to maintain uh, a very, very dubious position on issues like uh, Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, mercifully, we were able to put Sikkim behind us uh, in uh, 2005 after years of negotiations. Uh, and despite the initial, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, protest by China and negative positions, China eventually did give uh, at the level of Premier Wan Chiapao to Prime Minister Manmohan Singh uh, a small map showing uh, Sikkim as an integral part of India. It took years of negotiations. That too didn't resolve all problems. It was a small scale map. And so the disputatious part of Sikkim, for instance, in North Sikkim, we have the finger area, or for instance, the tri-junction with Bhutan, where uh, you have heard of all the, uh, you know, problems taking place uh, uh, quite close to the Doklam Plateau. Uh, uh, these issues still remain uh, as a result of that map being small scale and China not fully revealing its hand. Uh, so this is part of uh, their overall practice of uh, 
uh, being opaque and not fully revealing their options, keeping something, holding it back so that it can be, uh, you know, churned out in a different uh, interpretation later on. We have seen that even in terms of the, you know, LSE clarification exercise uh, that we undertook with them in the middle sector in the past and which has since run into the ground. Um, so, uh, we today find that uh, there is a need for a fundamental reset in our relations with China. Uh, overall, I find that uh, the multilateral space, for instance, which had long remained uh, uh, a very uh, sort of feasible area for cooperation between India and China in the past on things like environment, on climate change, on uh, you know global developmental goals, the millennium, uh, you know, uh, uh, millennial, uh, you know, development, uh, sustainable developmental uh, goals, etc. These today are not uh, going to provide the same kind of uh, convergence uh, and congruence to India and China to work together, uh, because China is pulling away on all these issues. It has now developed its own uh, sort of uh, uh, China-centric uh, uh, policies uh, in tandem with the West, even on things like climate change, environment. Um, it is taking actively the issue of Jammu and Kashmir, uh, attempting to take it to the United Nations, uh, raking it up there under the uh, sort of uh, uh, prodding of uh, Pakistan. Uh, and this obviously is eroding the multilateral space for cooperation. And that I think is something that uh, the shrinking of this space um, uh, is uh, something that uh, is also new and we have to keep it in mind. Um, we today find that we are engaged in a dialogue at all levels. Uh, there is a political level dialogue. There is a diplomatic dialogue uh, in the working group, uh, you know, mechanism. And uh, there is a military dialogue at the level of the core commanders. The problem has not been resolved in terms of the, uh, you know, uh, disengagement and de-escalation de uh, in Ladakh, which is um, uh, a creation uh, of of uh, of China. China is the one that actually uh, brought in its uh, uh, large numbers of troops uh, all of a sudden and positioned them uh, along the uh, so-called, uh, you know, LAC. Uh, and uh, that has resulted in the tensions that we see today. Uh, we expect the Chinese to uh, first uh, disengage by pulling back their troops uh, from wherever they have uh, needlessly uh, been uh, deployed. And it is only after that that there can be de-escalation. Obviously, we are not going to de-escalate without that disengagement first being uh, visible to us in a convincing manner on the part of China. Um, it is also not a, an India that is going to simply accept what China says. Um, and see, militarily, many people speak about the huge gap between India and China in terms of military prowess. But I would also like to caution you and urge you to take a slightly broader view of this because we have seen it ourselves with Pakistan, haven't we? Uh, India is a much bigger power uh, in terms of geography, in terms of economic size. We are, I think, anything between seven and nine times the size of Pakistan. And yet we find that as far as the international boundary with Pakistan and the line of control with Pakistan is concerned, willy-nilly over a period of uh, adversarial uh, coexistence, there evolves a symmetry of military power on both sides, such that is difficult to uh, ignore. Uh, so for the same reason, when it comes to India and China, it is not all about the absolute asymmetry in uh, terms of either geography or GDP. It is uh, really the kind of symmetry uh, that evolves on a particular border as a result of uh, uh, your uh, you know, determination, uh, national sort of resolution, uh, uh, resoluteness to to uh, prevent any kind of arbitrary action by the other that causes uh, uh, a, a new equilibrium and a new military symmetry to develop. And we do have uh, uh, enough capabilities on our northern borders today to uh, to you know actually make any kind of military uh, adventurism by China prove to be a very very costly exercise for them. Uh, so, but if I look ahead and 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 as a well wisher of uh, you know both the peoples of India and China and say, look, we really at the end of the day need to uh, you know find some modus vivendi to live in peace in centuries to come because they can't wish us away and we can't wish them away. And so at some point of time, uh, you know some kind of modus vivendi will have to be put in place. And I think that must also include efforts at the level of uh, the peoples. 
Uh, people in India participate much more in national policy formulation vis-a-vis -vis China than do the people of China in terms of formulating Chinese policy towards India. The Chinese people, no matter what the Chinese government says, they really don't matter when it comes to external engagement. Uh, there may be some, you know, sort of uh, social media platforms where the youth of China, uh, you know, uh, cogitate and agitate uh, these international issues. But by and large, because of it, it being an authoritarian single party system with no real people participation, uh, the people of China don't participate in any kind of settlement with any country, etc. But we have a bigger uh, problem there because we have to overcome the hurdle of the opposition, of the media, uh, the checks and balances that are very much in evidence in any kind of democracy. At the end of the day, uh, people have to fight stereotypes. Uh, people have to understand uh, that um, uh, you know there should be greater transparency and consultation and I hope this is clear to the Chinese one day also that when they look to spread their power through Asia, when particularly in the Indian Ocean, particularly in South Asia, particularly on my, as in India's periphery, in Sri Lanka, in the Maldives, in Bangladesh, in Nepal, uh, they, there should be greater transparency. Uh, it, it, China has to work much harder, not only to demonstrate its uh, uh, capabilities and capacities. Those are obviously self-evident, uh, but it, they have to work much harder to ensure that we... Uh, are able to uh, get the necessary, uh, seek the necessary assurances that we want regarding their motivation and in intentions. It is intentions that are not clear when it comes to China. Their capacities are, are wondrously clear to us. And so I think it is for China to do that kind of hard work uh, in order to improve relations. Last word on Pakistan and I'll stop. Uh, I've spoken for 46 minutes uh, and uh, I'm told that uh, we go on to 11.15. And I thought we'd leave some time for uh, Q&A. Uh, Pakistan is one of our most difficult relationships. It's uh, uh, in many ways, uh, to use a, a pejorative English phrase, it's more like an albatross round our neck, you know. It's a, a cross that we uh, bear on our shoulders and have done so ever since uh, uh, partition, you know. Whether militarily, whether economic, uh, whether ideologically, whether in terms of the geostrategic tandem that they have, you know, formed gradually with China, uh, the subversion of India's neighbors that Pakistan attempts all the time. Uh, this has caused uh, us to have adversarial relations uh, for as long as both have existed as, as independent countries. You know, Pakistan has, has been responsible directly for initiating all the four wars that we have fought, you know, whether it's 1947, uh, whether it's 1965, 1971, or whether it was uh, Kargil in 1999. And um, these contentious issues that divide us uh, continue to, uh, you know, bog the relationship down. The, you know, issue of Jammu and Kashmir, the issue of terrorism, uh, Pakistan's unbridled, brazen support uh, to uh, terrorist uh, infrastructure, uh, the kind of attacks that they have carried out uh, uh, on India, uh, whether in Uri, whether in Pathan Court, uh, whether uh, later in, uh, uh, you know, Pulwama, as we have seen. And over the years, of course, uh, India has uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, gone from one extreme to the other. Uh, but I think we are seeing a sea change after 2014. There is a much greater determination on the part of Prime Minister Modi's government not to uh, take things uh, lying down. And so there is this zero tolerance for terrorism that has been developed, uh, a policy which has been thereafter executed in terms of the response that we delivered post Uri and Pathan court in 2016, in terms of the, uh, you know, uh, ground operations, uh, cross-border strikes, and uh, more recently in 2019, in terms of the cross-border airstrikes that we executed uh, following the dastardly attack at, at Pulwama. Um, this is something that uh, needs to be kept in mind. Um, and we have seen uh, that this contrasts very sharply uh, with... Uh, uh, you know, earlier responses that we have uh, given to uh, Pakistan. Uh, they have meanwhile continued to shelter and support the L.E.T., Jashe Mohammed, uh, even the Indian mafia uh, gangsters uh, like the, you know, the, the D Company, etc., uh, all of which are proscribed by the UN uh, and in mul multiple other fora. The Bhatkal brothers, the Indian Mujahideen, these were all supported too, uh, you know, uh, and given training and resources uh, by the Pakistani state. 
so for us, of course, this remains uh, a primary ask of Pakistan that until and unless Pakistan fundamentally ceases to provide uh, material support to uh, these terror groups, uh, unless and until it completely drains that swamp of terrorism and terrorist infrastructure that it has created on its side, uh, primarily to destabilize India, we cannot have business as usual with them. We can have business as usual, as Dr. Jashankar has said, with a normal neighbor. We can have normal relations with a normal neighbor. But if the neighbor itself is not normal, we cannot have normal relations. And I think we should not be, uh, you know, under any kind of illusion that we can have normal relations with an abnormal neighbor. Uh, so uh, they, Pakistan continues to remain heavily invested, for instance, in, in amplifying the communal divide within India, providing material support to disaffected groups to basically keep India busy and tied up, hogtied with uh, internal issues. Uh, post Article 370, you've seen the kind of activism that uh, uh, Imran Khan's government has uh, shown. Uh, again, uh, you know, within the country, uh, kind of rabble rousing, etc., and also trying to rabble rouse at the uh, international level. Um, in the post Galwan scenario, we have seen a much greater convergence now, as I was trying to point out earlier, between China and Pakistan. Uh, and that kind of suits China's requirement also, because China is also very keen to keep India boxed in, uh, into the smaller box of South Asia, and is loath to see India, uh, you know, live out its own destiny as a rising power. Uh, one that can potentially match China, albeit with a totally different uh, economic and uh, you know governance model that we have. Uh, the long-term bets, of course, are still on India uh, because China's success, as I was trying to tell you, cannot be assured in that that third third thirty-year period that began in two thousand and nine. Uh, the last eleven years have been fairly uh, you know uh, disruptive for China. It's not uh, coming to China without a cost. And the next 20 years, uh, you know, if that will show where China heads, a lot of uh, China's success is riding on its uh, authoritarian single party system, the, the communist, uh, you know, Chinese Communist Party uh, and that uh, authoritarian uh, ideological, uh, you know, structure, Marxism, etc. that they have there. If you were to remove that structure, uh, then it is a moot question whether, uh, you know, uh, uh, China continues to remain uh, the same, uh, follows the same policies, uh, with or without, uh, say, President Xi Jinping, would China continue to uh, be as combative, as adversarial as it has been under him? For it was not, uh, prior to that, as adversarial as it is now under him. Would it continue to still promote the Belt and Road Initiative in the same manner as uh, it's been doing under him? These are all moot questions, you know, and uh, uh, time will tell how this pans out, but we have to be on the lookout for this uh, uh, Sinopak axis, uh, what the two of them describe as a relationship that is as deep as the Indian Ocean and as high as the Himalayas, um, you know, these catchy aphorisms that the Chinese use to describe such relations. They describe the relationship with that Potemkin, Potemkin state called North Korea as ones of one of lips and teeth, being as close as lips and teeth, you know. So we still have to be mindful when we look at our broad uh, regional geography. We have to be mindful that Pakistan uh, has been uh, the key proliferator also in terms of uh, weapons of mass destruction all the way in this broad swathe of the Indo-Pacific, all the way up to Japan in the Hiroshima Peace Museum. If you were to go one day, you will see in the rogues gallery there that they have a very beautiful picture of this uh, brigand called uh, Dr. A.Q. Khan, who created... Uh, a virtual nuclear proliferation workshop in Pakistan and dealt proliferation technologies out like you would you would dish out uh, you know uh, uh, cards at a card game. Uh, so uh, this is the kind of uh, uh, you know regional construct in which uh, we continue to see Sark being thwarted. Sark has not been able to realize its full potential, despite India making efforts, despite India proposing to have a Sark satellite, to have a Sark. Uh, what you call motor transport agreement. Um, we have not been able to see uh, that kind of cooperation. And yet it is India that's been trying to kickstart SARC, as we saw in the post-COVID-19 response of Prime Minister Modi taking the initiative to consult uh, the SARC countries and to develop a kind of regional response. India has been trying that and initiating that action um, within the G20 as well. 
This despite the fact, as I said at the beginning of my talk, that the global governance structures have not been uh, responding adequately. Um, and we have also therefore tried to focus simultaneously on other structures, uh, regional structures like, uh, uh, you know, BIMSTEC uh, towards our east. We have been trying to focus a little more. Um, we are trying to make use of this concept called SARC minus one. If one party is holding up everything in SARC, we can at least try to work with the others and, uh, you know, take it in whichever direction uh, we can go. Uh, so let's say that uh, the rapid spread of, I'll end by saying that the rapid spread of the coronavirus has created new challenges. It's also created new opportunities for dialogue for India. India has been very quick off the mark in terms of providing help and assistance to various countries, including uh, you know, those in the Gulf, uh, in our near neighborhood, uh, in Africa, uh, we have mounted a number of, uh, you know, sort of uh, relief missions everywhere. Uh, and uh, our foundations basically rest on the teachings of Buddha and Gandhi. Basically, uh, all the great religions of India also have taught us uh, as a people to be more tolerant and assimilative and to follow the path of peace and progress. But that does not mean that India would balk or hesitate to use force to defend itself or to teach any aggressor a good lesson. And I think that is the one good thing that we are seeing uh, uh, under this government, that uh, this government is capable of mobilizing resources and the people of India in a very convincing way to give a, a robust response to uh, our adversaries. Uh, and we will obviously do what it takes uh, to promote both peace uh, uh, and progress and alongside protect our uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity. I think this in uh, broad, uh, you know, sums up the global security uh, scenario that I wanted to paint for you all today. Thank you for listening to me so uh, patiently. And I'm, I'm happy over the next 20 minutes to answer any questions. I uh, hope uh, Commodore Robbie Thomas will help me a little bit with that. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Sorry. Definitely, sir. Thank you very and, much. And sir, let me this. let me end by also saying I'm so glad to see uh, my colleague and and a former colleague and dear friend Mrs. Nitalal Butalia. She has actually joined us eventually. I think for most of the uh, talk she was uh, around. We're very happy to see you there and thank you. I publicly acknowledged your contribution to setting this up. So So I was hoping from the time we started have this the power of N added. It is so contemporary and so relevant. Thank you so much, sir. Without taking thank you. Information that they would be. But I must uh, tell you, sir, this was because a lot of our officers are doing some preparation of various things and to keep them really a valued resource and excellent session. And Thank you. To you and your team. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, I think I'll straight away attack the questions. Uh, we have 10 fairly elaborate questions and we have 15 minutes to go into that. So I'll ask you uh, mostly China uh, and our neighborhood related. I'll first take the first three questions. Uh, we have a set of three uh, from Mr. Paritosh Vinit Vyas. Question number one, as a matter of policy, India has not commented on the internal affairs of its neighbors. However, in response to China's internationalization of Kashmir, how prudent would it be for India to highlight China's human rights violations in Hong Kong, Tibet, Xinjiang, etc. Question number two, sir. How can we bridge the information asymmetry? I will repeat that information asymmetry between India and China, considering the limitations placed by the Great Firewall. Question number three, sir. The China Task Force of the US House of Representatives recommends a grouping of 10 democracies or the Quad to contest China. Would joining this be a compromise of India's strategic autonomy or a tacit acknowledgement of an alliance, our alliance with the United States? 
So I'll leave you with these three first, sir. So these are all very uh, interesting questions, and uh, uh, I will try to be brief. I don't want the answers to uh, develop into standalone lectures. Uh, uh, so I would uh, begin by saying uh, that you know India has traditionally sought to avoid interfering in any country's internal affairs, uh, and uh, that obviously uh, rings true for uh, uh, China as well. Now, for instance. Uh, uh, the questioner um, asked whether, uh, you know, we should be highlighting uh, the uh, domestic contradictions uh, within China insofar as, for instance, Xinjiang is concerned or, uh, you know, Tibet or Hong Kong. Um, and of course, uh, Taiwan is not a part of uh, China in, in that physical sense. Uh, but even that is an issue on which uh, a lot of people raise this uh, particular question. Now, I feel that generally speaking, we have to keep in mind that uh, we have been pretty consistent in following a one China policy right from the beginning. Now, for instance, in 1954, uh, in our agreement, uh, we recognized uh, Tibet as uh, a part of China, and that has generally remained consistent. Uh, so it's not something on which, uh, you know, I can uh, foresee any kind of major change in policy. Um, uh, as far as Hong Kong is concerned, uh, we have seen that uh, uh, till very recently, Hong Kong had an identity of its own. Even after the handover in 1997, uh, it was guaranteed according to its basic law, which is its constitution, uh, a, an unchanged system for the next 50 years as Hong Kong special administrative region. Uh, and uh, it is only in the last uh, couple of years that we have seen since the umbrella uh, revolution there and uh, the protests that have been, uh, you know, manifesting themselves as China systematically tried to erode the autonomy that it had itself guaranteed to Hong Kong. We have a very large number of Indians, people of Indian origin living there in Hong Kong and in deciding on anything, we must always keep in mind their long-term interests as well. Um, as for Xinjiang, again, Xinjiang has uh, uh, been festering for quite some time now. Uh, and... Um, uh, uh, it's it's a great irony that uh, uh, you know uh, countries like uh, Turkey, uh, Pakistan, uh, even Saudi Arabia and others, uh, the great uh, you know protectors of uh, uh, Islam, have had very little to say about the internal situation in Xinjiang. Uh, uh, there are some brave writers. I found that there was one Pakistani uh, uh, lady. Uh, a journalist who wrote a piece the other day, a scathing indictment of Pakistan's own policies towards uh, Xinjiang. The OIC has kept mum about some of these things. Um, of late, the United States uh, has been a little more active in terms of the Senate and the Congress in terms of passing uh, various types of legislation uh, with regard to Xinjiang to prevent, uh, you know, the surveillance taking place there, the abuse, the human rights violations, uh, and threatening to sanction uh, Chinese who engage in such activities. In Tibet also, uh, the U.S. has passed some legislation uh, to ensure that uh, uh, the Chinese officials who seek to interfere in the religious and ecclesiastical affairs, including potentially the selection of the high lamas in the future, uh, desist from doing so under the threat of sanctions, you know. Uh, and uh, as far as Hong Kong is concerned, also some fresh legislation has been passed. Many Western countries have uh, condemned uh, what is happening in Hong Kong today. My moot question there would be that um, uh, all of that uh, can help only to a certain extent. It will not resolve your fundamental issues. Your continental contestation on the boundary with China is not going to get resolved uh, by uh, you know, saying or doing anything more than what you deem necessary. Uh, now, uh, how to bridge the information asymmetry uh, given the great firewall in, um, uh, you know, in, in, in China? Uh, this is a very big question because China has done uh, its utmost to keep out uh, all the information that it doesn't want uh, to reach its people in a selective way. Uh, it has created a firewall in which uh, its own diplomats use uh, uh, WhatsApp uh, and Twitter abroad and Google abroad to great effect. 
But uh, in China, they will ban Microsoft and Google and, and WhatsApp, et cetera. Um, so that great firewall that, that they've created is more like a, a kind of intranet that they have uh, created, the kind of intranet that you can expect North Korea to create or even the Army, Navy, Air Force will create for their own uh, you know, safety and security. The Chinese have created it at such a mass level involving 1.4 billion people. They have kept them uh, selectively informed of their own propaganda and selectively cut off from the rest of the world. But information has a way of getting through at the end of the day, you know, and um, the very fact that uh, people are connected uh, opens up uh, China too. Uh, the Chinese people also increasingly learn uh, one way or the other about what is happening. So I think it's only uh, a matter of time before uh, the Chinese themselves come under great pressure. Uh, Xi Jinping, as you know, in the time that he's been around, has systematically eroded the role of journalists in China to prevent them from saying or writing or doing anything that goes against uh, the party's diktat. Uh, systematically, they have tried to, um, you know, crack down on any kind of human rights uh, activists in China uh, and systematically eroded the role of uh, whatever nascent NGOs that had come up uh, in the last 30 years in China. Of course, these NGOs were primarily focused more on, on uh, developmental issues, regional uh, economic issues, uh, uh, issues relating to the environment and, you know, justice and jobs and employment and, and backlog in wages. And, and, but all that has been systematically eroded. So there is a concerted effort that China is making uh, to create this kind of an iron dome with regard to uh, the flow of information uh, and propaganda. Uh, but at the same time, the global connect today is such uh, that it's impossible for China to escape the effects of uh, a much more in interconnected world. Um, the task force, China task force, recommending 10 democracies to, uh, you know, sort of uh, contest China uh, in, in, in the strategic uh, uh, sphere and, and what it does, uh, if India were to join it, what will it do to our strategic autonomy? Now here, the key point I want to make is that, remember one thing, that uh, uh, the world today is of many colors and hues when it comes to its uh, governance systems and forms of, of uh, governance, you know. Um, and uh, it is not possible to use, you know, uh, sort of uh, one brush to, to a kind of tar all to say that uh, it's only uh, 10 democracies that should uh, come together to, uh, you know, point out uh, the uh, sort of uh, insidious nature of China's policies. Uh, because when you, when you say that democracy is a self-limiting concept, you know, take a look at the uh, Asia Pacific or the Indo-Pacific. The quadrilateral uh, security dialogue is made up of four countries that are essentially democracies. But even we differ one from the other. The Americans, uh, the Japanese, the Australians in India, we are all democ democratic countries, but our, our democratic uh, models, again, are, are nuanced and they differ one from the other. But the ones that we are seeking to work together with in the Indo-Pacific, uh, let us say the ASEAN countries, let us say all the others, not necessary that they are all democracies. It is for that reason that even the Quad did not uh, insist on the word democracy uh, after a few initial press releases, if you were to examine closely, the Quad countries were initially talking about uh, democracy. The word democracy used to figure alongside open, transparent, rules-based order in the Indo-Pacific. They, they used the word democratic in the earlier stages. Today, if you were to closely examine uh, the uh, press release after any meeting, uh, uh, there is a tendency not to harp on the word democratic. Because when you speak of Vietnam, for instance, uh, that wishes to work with uh, India, the United States, Japan, and Australia, which is also under pressure from the Chinese, well, it's not a democracy. Uh, so are we going to say that we will limit the participation of countries uh, that uh, are uh, weighed under uh, by China's uh, negative policies? I mean, they cannot participate uh, in developing a broad front against Chinese policies because they are not your archetypal democracy. So personally, I am a little skeptical about, uh, you know, to, to overemphasis on the word democracies. The emphasis should be on 
certain broadly acceptable uh, global parameters of uh, of development uh, uh, and rules basically uh, not necessarily uh, whether they are your typical definition of fit the bill of your uh, of your uh, interpretation of democracy uh, i don't think uh, uh, our associating with any grouping really erodes our strategic autonomy because strategic autonomy in reality means that india can exercise its own choices whether to uh, uh, align with one or the other based on our national interests so i think strategic autonomy is what gave us the choice to follow non alignment in the early stages it is also the same strategic autonomy that allowed us to in 1962 approach the united states of america for arms and assistance during the chinese aggression it is the same strategic autonomy that allowed us in 1971 to conclude the treaty of uh, uh, friendship and cooperation with the soviet union and it is the same strategic autonomy that today has allowed us to uh, work more closely uh, with like minded countries especially the united states of america to develop what we call issue based alignment on specific issues you know so today we have a very deep uh, relationship with the united states of america including uh, you know logistics uh, uh, you know cross servicing agreements um, uh, you know agreements with regard to security uh, of uh, information and data uh, and uh, uh, communications uh, etc and yet we are not an alliance partner uh, we are aligning but we are not in an alliance partnership with them uh, so i think strategic autonomy is something that gives us a chance to do all this and uh, it must continue uh, to free us up from uh, these uh, um, ideational limitations so yes if it helps us to join the 10 country you know d10 uh, join it but that doesn't prevent me from uh, continuing to discuss uh, uh, with russia and china whatever uh, suits my interest in the ric uh, you know ric format or uh, from participating as i choose to in the sco the shanghai cooperation organization uh, or for that matter uh, having a malabar exercise with uh, three or maybe four countries you know so uh, we we have to maintain our strategic autonomy i think the days of uh, pure and simple alliances are uh, also over uh, it's very difficult today even the us which has such a vast plethora of alliance partnerships around 37 in one form or the other around the world from uh, not counting the lily pads that they have uh, around the world smaller arrangements uh, even they are in uh, currently in a phase where uh, you know alliance uh, partnerships are under stress and duress uh because of uh, trumpism and uh, the current us policy of america first etc uh so we we really don't need to go down that road uh, strategic uh, strategic autonomy and national interests uh, should determine what we do in one grouping or the other and it may be called what it is uh thank you very much sir i think uh, we can just squeeze in one more question uh, we are just short of time the question is uh, us japan australia have shown willingness to work in tandem in the quad why is india still showing hesitancy in this front this is from dr dev jyoti burman well i'm not sure if it is india that's showing hesitation uh, the fact of the matter is that in 2004 after the tsunami uh, these four countries had demonstrated the ability to carry out uh, uh you know disaster relief as first responders india had been in the forefront of that exercise and uh, in 2007 if i recall correctly we had a four nation uh, you know well it wasn't a four nation it was a five nation naval exercise that included singapore also at that point of time thereafter the australians developed cold feet under kevin rudd uh, as prime minister and uh, backed out of uh, further iterations of the same naval exercise in 2015 we brought back uh japan as a permanent uh, participant in the malabar exercise and um, thereafter uh, the three countries have been carrying this out our bilateral military engagement with australia is uh, deepening by the day whether it is the uh, annual you know kakadu exercise or whether it is the pitch black exercise in which the air force uh, you know participates uh, with the australians 
we are bringing up our bilateral relationship as you saw in the recent uh, uh, online uh, summit held between uh, the two prime ministers we also now have uh, a logistics pact with uh, with the with the australians we have uh, uh, a new uh, naval cooperation uh, agreement with them uh, so we are bringing up our cooperation to new levels and i'm not quite sure if it is uh, 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 fair to say that india is holding it up now it's after all four countries that decide so when the time is ripe uh, they will come and exercise uh, in a four country format others have been doing it with us i think it was india um, japan and uh, the united states that exercised with uh, uh, the philippines uh, in a kind of quad formation and it was uh, united states japan and australia that exercised with vietnam in a quad formation so so there are other quads also working out uh, in terms of the like minded countries i'll uh, take one more you. if you want yeah. uh okay sir then i think i'll feel one more uh, the question is uh, rules based multilateral organizations have been a disappointment for india including un and wto whereas china has been brazenly flouting international legal uh, structures without any sanction therefore what are india's choices should we uh, should we continue championing multi multilateralism to should we remain a passive observer while focusing on bilateral and sub regional groupings three should we withdraw from international bodies look multilateralism is a genie that cannot be put back in the bottle multilateralism multilateralism is like nuclear weapons technology uh, which is also another genie that cannot be put back in the bottle these are things whether uh, technology uh, knowledge or behavior that cannot be unlearned uh, so multilateralism is here to stay in fact uh, the benefits of multilateralism uh, far outweigh uh, the fact that uh, not everyone has been equally benefited by globalization uh, so whether it is trade whether it is technology whether it is uh, uh, you know uh, uh, foreign direct investment multilateralism is the basis for all uh, you know uh, progress of humanity uh, so there is no question of india Uh, uh backing out of multilateral fora and structures we have been at the forefront um we were we are a founding member of the united nations we have uh, uh you know played a very key role uh in uh, south south cooperation in the g77 uh, uh format uh, we have been engaging uh the g7 also we are part of the g20 uh and uh, all these are greatly uh, necessary for india to uh, get its act together and you know step up to the next level uh, of uh, engagement with the uh, rest of the world as india emerges into its own as it uh, progresses uh, towards the middle of this century to become one of the top 3 economies in the world as has been long predicted by goldman sachs and those fundamentals still remain in place notwithstanding covid notwithstanding the current current downturn in economic growth we are still quite assured of getting to that place by the middle of this century given all that india should be seeking to play a more robust role in governance structures and as has been said by our prime minister by the foreign minister earlier that we are no longer happy to simply uh, be a follower uh, we are interested in playing the role of uh, uh you know an active role in terms of shaping outcomes uh, we don't want to be camp follower we would actually like to ensure that we shape outcomes we determine uh, the discourse uh, and the deliberations in such a manner that that we can actually impact on what eventually is decided so there should be more of multilateralism activity on our side yes it's true that we haven't made it uh, to the united nations now that's a lost opportunity uh there is enough evidence to suggest uh, in the correspondence between vijay lakshmi pandit pandit nehru's sister who was uh, our ambassador in in washington dc in 1950 and pandit nehru himself uh, uh, we can see in that correspondence that the americans were keen in 1950 there was talk that india should uh, take a seat in the un security council that was the time when uh, you know the uh, republic of china in taiwan Uh, was still uh, continuing to be a member of the un 
as it was since 1945 and also a member of the UN Security Council. The People's Republic of China was not uh, a member of the United Nations or the UN Security Council. And there were efforts by the Americans. Uh, there was talk uh, by them as well as uh, in Bulganin's uh, uh, talks with, uh, with uh, Nehru in, the, in 1955, when Bulganin had spoken of uh, having uh, India in as the sixth member of the Security Council. And, and we saw that that was a lost opportunity because uh, at, for, for some reason, Panditji was of the view that, no, it was China that should, uh, China as in the People's Republic of China that deserved that spot in the Security Council and that India really uh, was not up to it at that point of time. And today we are still paying the price of that. But notwithstanding that, I think uh, uh, a time will come when the world will have to accommodate uh, India for what it is, which is, you know, uh, the world's second largest and soon to be the most populous country in the world and by the middle of this century in the top three. And as the Prime Minister said in his own address to the, uh, you know, UN General Assembly very recently, how long will the world keep a large country like India out with all its contributions in, and we've been one of the first to contribute to UN peacekeeping operations, the largest number of lives that any country has lost in UN peacekeeping operations is India. Uh, we have virtually participated in every important uh, peacekeeping operation and uh, we continue to, to, to provide that kind of leadership uh, uh, in uh, regional structures as well. So uh, I, I feel uh, there is every reason why we should uh, continue to plow that furrow of, uh, of participation at the global level in, in, in virtually every organization possible. Look, the Chinese have gamed that very well. One of the reasons why the Chinese have been able to do so well is, is the gaming of global structures, whether it was the WTO, where they sought entry in uh, 2001 and got it with the help of the United States of America. Uh, the Americans had cut them a special deal in 1999 uh, when uh, that annual certification uh, you know, for China's behavior was no longer required in order to renew their preferential trade agreement. Uh, and by 2001, they came into the WTO uh, in 2016, they were supposed to get what you call market economy status automatically at the end of 15 years in the WTO. And they still haven't got it because they aren't a market economy. But you can see how wondrously they have gamed, gamed the WTO. After joining the WTO, there was no looking back because the world's markets were like uh, the proverbial oyster at their feet. And they were able to grow unimpeded and to emerge as the world's uh, second largest economy today. Uh, so... Gaming global structures is very, very important. And I think we should have a strategic focus on gaming uh, global structures everywhere to play them very, very carefully, astutely uh, to our advantage. Uh, thank you very much, sir. I think with that, we come to the end of this session. I would like to thank you and all the participants for making this such a wonderful session. Uh, our next session would start at 11.30. It is India-China Trade by Professor S.K. Mohanty, which will be taken up by uh, Nasin Webmaster. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you all very much. Have a nice day. Wish you all good health. Bye-bye.